Hello, my name's Amy and welcome to another video. Now it has been a really, really long time since I last made a book video, so I thought today I would run you through everything I have read since the start of the year. Now this also includes a few audiobooks that I've really enjoyed and also some books that I'm currently in the middle of, so let's get going. We're going to start with my most recent read, which was The House in the Pines. Now this is one of those books that has been going around social media quite a lot recently and I have had mixed feelings about a lot of the thrillers I've read over the last few years. This one looked interesting so I thought I would give it a go. We are following a character who briefly dated a man who she believes has the power to kill people without touching them. One of her best friends died when she was young, shortly after she dated this man, and then she sees a viral video in which another young woman is sitting with him and appears to just keel over. There are lots of themes in the book of whether we can trust ourselves and our memories and whether other people can make us think and believe different things. I will say I started out by really enjoying this book because the writing is superb. I think there's been a bit of a trend in thrillers recently that they're becoming a little bit more literary and there is some fantastic writing on offer in this book. It just flows so beautifully. So that definitely dragged me into the story and I read the first half very very quickly. The problem for me from that point was that despite really enjoying the story and really liking the characters there was not a single plot twist that I did not guess in advance and some of them quite a long way in advance. There seemed to me only one possible outcome and explanation for what was going on in the story and I was proved right. So I would have liked some more surprises even if they were just minor plot twists and I didn't get those but I will say the writing is fantastic and the characterization is very strong and this definitely falls into the category of psychological thriller. There's not a huge amount of action in this story but it doesn't really need it because it's diving very deeply into the main character's psyche and her memories and what she believes and it does that very well. Now another book that falls on the literary spectrum I suppose you could say is The Glass Hotel. Now I think Station Eleven is Emily St John Mandel's most famous book but The Glass Hotel just looked more interesting to me personally so I read that one first. Again, this falls into the category of having really excellent writing. It's literary without being overblown and the prose very much draws you in. I found it quite difficult to put down once I'd picked it up. This is a hard book to summarise. A lot of the story does revolve around the hotel on the Vancouver coastline of the title but there's also a lot going on about financial crimes related to the 2008 financial crash. Now that was an unexpected plot line for me but one I really enjoyed because I do really enjoy non-fiction about financial crimes and corruption so this was right up my street. There was also a little bit of a hint of multiple worlds, parallel dimensions, possibly ghosts. There are some odd things going on in the book that are never fully explained. They're definitely there in the story but the author definitely leaves it up to the reader as to how to interpret these things and that continues right up to the end. This is another book actually where I was expecting a big twist at the end and I never got it. It didn't matter quite as much in this one because The Glass Hotel is not a thriller and isn't trying to be but because of some of the subject matter I was expecting a big science fictional twist at the end and and we never really got one. So as a character study and it really does connect all the characters really beautifully despite having quite a large cast, as a character study it works really well but don't go into this one expecting too much science fiction. It is much more 
on the literary end. Next we have got Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare. Now it's been a while since I've read a Cassandra Clare book and I'm obviously a really long way behind. She has written several series since Clockwork Prince and The Infernal Devices. Every so often though I just get the urge to go back and read one and I'm slowly making my way through them. Clockwork Prince is the middle book in a trilogy and I know this trilogy is a fan favourite but to be honest it did feel like the middle book of a trilogy to me. There is not a huge amount of plot in this book. It's very very character focused and that's fine because I do like Claire's characters but there were also times in this when I was really longing for a bit more action and a bit more shadow hunting and less flirting and less fretting from the characters. I do feel as I read more of Claire's books that with each one she is getting lighter and lighter on the action and plot and heavier and heavier on the character work. So over time they are starting to interest me less and less but I still will finish this trilogy. Whether I go on from this one though remains to be seen. I think I might be coming to the end of my interest in this world. Now there is one last book I finished quite early on in the year which is a bit different to everything else on this list which is The Forgotten House on the Moor. Now there's been a real trend in recent years for these kind of rural romances and rural rom-coms. They're usually set in some kind of stately home or in a cafe or a bed and breakfast. There's often some kind of business involved. There is often a young female character who is moving from the city and trying to have a fresh start. The Forgotten House on the Moor doesn't exactly follow that pattern because our main character is in her late 30s and she already lives in the countryside. But the story starts when her ex-husband, who she hasn't seen in years, is blown up, quite literally, in an explosion in an abandoned house on the moor. The house is also rumoured to be haunted and our main character gets involved with a local stately homeowner, there is still a stately home, who has been researching paranormal phenomena and ghost hunting at this location. It was really interesting to me to see one of these rom-coms delve into a little bit of the supernatural, that definitely drew me in. But don't go into this one expecting it to be heavy on the ghost elements. They are there and they're fun but really this is a romantic comedy above all else. And it genuinely is quite funny at times. I did enjoy Jane Lovering's writing style quite a lot. My one criticism of it is that our main character is supposed to be I think in her mid to late 30s but honestly she read to me more like a woman in her 50s or 60s. She was making a lot of references to things that are way before my time and I am in my mid 30s. But it was a lot of fun, a very easy read. I enjoyed the central relationship and the side characters. Some of the plot did rather stretch my belief and also the big plot twist was once again one I kind of saw coming but it was a fun easy read that definitely made me laugh. Now let's talk about the audiobooks. Now I did actually read or rather listen to one audiobook very early in the year that I was going to talk about but I've decided not to. It was an indie author book, quite a short one, written by an indie author, but I didn't really get out of it what I'd hoped to and I was a bit disappointed by it. So rather than trash it on camera, we will just leave it at that. The one other book I did want to talk about though, which I'm about halfway through, is The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre. Now most of my audio listening is non-fiction, whether that's books or podcasts, and I really do like a spy thriller. Particularly anything Cold War is absolutely fascinating to me. So this one is a true story about a KGB spy who from the kind of 70s onwards started working as a double agent for MI6. Now it's very detailed, there are a lot of descriptions of life within the KGB and work in MI6. There are also a huge number of names in this one because 
because the book is obviously talking about real people and these are people who are coming and going in different jobs and roles within these secret services. So there's a lot to wrap your head around and it is very detailed but it is also incredibly compelling. Now I realised that I could go and look up the people involved on Wikipedia and find out what happened to them but I've decided not to do that because I am enjoying this book as though it was a novel and I really want to experience the outcome in that story format rather than looking it up online. I'm about halfway through and the narrative has got up to the late 70s early 80s. The double agent in question has just been posted to the UK and is continuing to spy for MI6 whilst advancing through the ranks of the KGB and it really has been a fascinating look at how these different services operate what life was like in Russia at the time and how spycraft operated from the decades between the 60s and 80s. I do keep wondering how there is another half of the book to go because it feels like the story is quite advanced already but there has been a bit of a twist right in the middle as if this was an actual spy novel and things just keep getting more fascinating with every chapter. So if like me you are interested in a good real life spy story, I realise this may be a very very small subset of my audience but you might exist, I would definitely give this one a go. And finally we're going to talk about a few of the books that I'm halfway through. First of all let's talk about Dragon Mage by M. L. Spencer. Now this is the first in a series and it is self-published and it has also been all over social media recently. It has been incredibly popular. I'm about 70% of the way through and I am really enjoying it so far. We are thrown into a world that has been split in two. We've got a world above and a world below. Magic in the world above is very restricted and basically has to be hard from people in a very unpleasant manner and there are certain machinations within the world above to bring the two worlds back together and restore magic. Our two main characters grow up in a small fishing village. One is actually immune to magic and one has very strong magical ability and we follow these two young men as they grow up in this village, as they discover their powers and abilities, as they then become separated and follow very different paths and then as they are brought back together this time in the world below. Now of course there are also dragons as the story suggests and there is a lot of magic and a lot of action. Really I think the central thread of this book though is the relationship between the two young characters and that is portrayed so beautifully. Both are very different and both have made mistakes on their respective paths but seeing them grow separately and then be brought back together is incredibly rewarding and their friendship really is one of the most endearing things I've seen on the page for a while. Now I have high hopes that the end of this book is going to be fairly explosive. A lot of action and intrigue has been built up so far. I'm expecting a lot more dragons in the last 30% and probably some very big battles. I think my one criticism of this book so far is that the villains, despite having some point of view chapters of their own, are a little bit one note and a little bit sort of moustache twirling. There's not a great deal of depth to them. It is possible we'll get a bit of a reversal in the last 30%, particularly with the main villain who has been in the story throughout. But really I think the focus of this book is on the heroes and they are very well characterised. So it has been a real pleasure to read about them so far. Next up we have The Black Tongue Thief. Now this is a really interesting book. I'm only about 20% of the way through. And this book has got the most distinctive voice I have read in a fantasy book in a very long time. It is told in the first person, our main character 
I think his name is Kinch, although I'm not 100% sure on that because it's not said very often in the book. He is a thief and he is thrown in with a female knight of sorts who seems to be on a mission. But the interesting thing here really is not actually the plot, at least not in the first 20%, it is Kinch's voice. It is very, very sweary, often very inventively so, and depending on whether you like the humour or not, you will either find this hilariously funny or it will fall completely flat for you. I will say I have mostly enjoyed the humour so far, but there are moments when I do find myself rolling my eyes at it because it is a little bit overdone, and there are moments when I would prefer a little bit less waffle from Kinch about the world building and a little bit more action. But I do acknowledge that I am only 20% of the way through the book and I think things are going to heat up very fast from this point. But like I say, if you're interested in this one, I would definitely read the first couple of chapters online just to see whether it clicks with you because it is going to be a bit of a love or hate voice. Next we have got Mage's Blood by David Hare. Now I have mentioned this in one or two vlogs recently so I won't go into a huge amount of detail but this is the first book in an epic fantasy quartet. It has a huge cast of characters, it is quite dense, a lot of place names, a lot of character names, it's also very political. We are following characters on both sides of a magical bridge which only resurfaces every few years between two land masses and every time it does resurface the northern continent basically goes on crusade in the southern continent. The world building in this one is interesting because there are lots of places names and customs that are very obviously taken from real world history but then they are twisted a bit. This isn't an effect that I really like because it can feel a bit lazy but I also feel like Hare is doing it for a reason. I think there may be some connection between this world and our own history but I'm only about 150 pages in so we haven't really had any hints on that yet. This is just a guess that I have in the back of my mind. I'm definitely enjoying the depth of the world building in this one and the complexity of the politics. It's a little bit too early for me to have really connected with any of the characters because for most of them we've had no more than one or two chapters from their perspective but the action is really just kicking in so I am expecting some very interesting things to come from the rest of the book. And finally I just wanted to mention Peril's Gate by Jani Wirtz. Now I have been reading this book for a good couple of years. I actually put it aside after I'd read about the first two thirds and kind of forgot I was reading it but I've just gone back to it in the last few days and I am really tearing through the final quarter of the book. It is really difficult to talk about this one without giving major spoilers but essentially we are following two half brothers, one with light magic and one with shadow magic, who are cursed to hate one another and essentially drag an entire continent into an internal war. Now I know Janny Wirtz's writing style is not for everyone, it is very very descriptive and when I first read it I really felt she just used too many descriptive words. Words. Having said that, it does have a very strong rhythm to it and once you've got past the first book you really kind of fall into it every time you pick up another one. So I've kind of stopped noticing the writing style at this point and I am just enjoying the story. I will say this central book, Peril's Gate, has been a little bit of a slog to get through. It is, I think, the longest book in the series so far. Quite a lot of the middle of the book is kind of an extended chase scene and for my liking it just went on a bit too long. And we are now following one of the half-brothers, Arathon, as he is trapped in a maze, which is forcing him to recollect all the atrocities and horrible things he's been forced to do. But that does mean it's kind of replaying most of the previous four or five books, which is a little bit slow going. 
I have got the feeling from reviews online that this is often a book that other readers have got a bit bogged down in, but that it is worth persevering because the series as a whole is so strong. And I would probably echo that. So that is where my reading stands as of late March 2023. I didn't actually read very much for the first six weeks of the year, so most of my reading has been in the last month or so. I am really enjoying getting back into it though and I have picked up some fabulous books this year. So I hope you will take some of these recommendations and have a look at some of these books for yourself and find maybe a new favourite. I would also love to know what you are reading right now so please let me know down in the comments. I will be back soon with another video. Until then keep reading everyone and I will see you next time.